Welcome to our program suited for survival and welcome to Smithsonian's National Zoo. I'm Kaden, my pronouns are they and them, and I will be your host for today as we look at some awesome animals and even get to see a couple of them up close. So I see a lot of you have found the emoji options. Give me a thumbs up if you are ready to start. Good, lots of thumbs up. If you're in a big class, you can always just turn and show your neighbor your thumbs up, show your teacher, show the screen. I love it, awesome, we're all ready to start. Good, okay, here's what I look like without a mask on. I will be wearing a mask today for the safety and health of our animals. They can catch some of the same things that we can and we wanna keep them healthy. So I'll try and speak up so that you can hear me, um, but we will have to keep the masks on today, just so you know. Okay, the National Zoo. Here is where I am. For those of you that don't know where this is, it is in Washington, D.C. You can see where that red dot is on the map. Now, this red dot, you might be able to find where you are in comparison to it. So I know we have a lot of people joining in the United States, but we have other countries as well. Here is a close up of the United States in case you have a problem finding your state. Okay, so if you joined us last month, I'm in the same spot as our last animal was last month, right here in the small mammal house. This is a great picture of what it looks like on a beautiful spring day. It definitely doesn't look like that today, but I love the trees in front of the small mammal house. Okay, now before I forget to tell you, make sure today that you grab something to draw on like a whiteboard or a piece of paper, a scratch paper will do, and something to draw with. Could be a pen, a pencil, a marker, whatever you want. We're gonna draw today together. So make sure you grab that while we keep getting started. And y'all know I love jokes, so joke time. What do you call a bald porcupine? Pointless, and they'd be called pointless because they don't have any points. Here's a really terrible drawing of what a porcupine might look like if it did not have any points. And it kind of looks like a beaver to me, but there it is. Okay, now you will hear someone else's voice. Shelly, say hi. Hi, Tata, and I'm so excited to be here and learn all about these different animals and their adaptations. Thank you. So you'll hear Shelly telling me when you all have questions that we should ask and all of that. Kenton, do you want to say hi? Hey everybody. My name is Kenton. I work here at the Small Mammal House. I'm so excited to be here today. So you'll see Kenton popping in a couple of times to show us a couple of the different animals that we're going to look at. So today we are going to be talking about survival. So our program is called Suited for Survival. So thinking about survival, we are going to talk about four different reasons that animals need to survive, right? Protection or ways they survive. Protection would be one. So an animal might have a way to protect themselves. They all need to get their four basic needs. Everyone remember what the four basic needs are? We'll talk about them in a couple programs. Pop them in the chat if you remember. I'm gonna open that. Good, I see food and water shelter and air. Good job, everybody. So they will find different ways so that they can find food, water, shelter, and air. Food and water, good. So we've got some of their four basic needs and shelter, just like you said. Animals also need to be able to reproduce. They can't just die off and not have any more left. So having babies is a great thing for them to survive. So for survival, the first animal that we're gonna talk about is this one. What is this? Hmm, I see it right there on the screen. It's a three-banded armadillo. Now, I would like to hear from you. Before we meet this animal, what are some different ways that this animal survives? It does it have a way to protect itself? Does it have a way to get food and water? Does it have a way to make or find shelter or reproduce? So pop in the chat. Kenton and I are going to look at the chat and see while you all do that. And then we can meet our animal. A lot of people are saying shell, Kenton. All right, come onto the screen. I'm going to stop sharing so Kenton can be seen a little bit closer. There we go. 
Well, hi everyone again. My name is Kent and I work here at the Small Mammal House. And today I have with us one of our friends. This is Martha. And she is a three-banded armadillo. So these species are really cool. And they're very strange because they can roll into a ball. So Martha, I just went to her exhibit and brought her to us. And she was sleeping. And she sleeps in this ball just like this. You can see she's almost perfectly tight because that's an adaptation to make sure that a predator doesn't eat her. So if she was sleeping in her habitat and somebody wanted to eat her, if a predator came and found her, they would try to get their claws and their mouth all over her, but they wouldn't be able to because this is all a hard shell. Now we call a shell on an armadillo a carapace. And that adaptation is so helpful, but it's actually similar to our own bodies. This material that makes this carapace, its shell, is the same as the material on your fingernails. It's actually like our hair. So that carapace can regrow, um, but it's mostly there as a defense mechanism. You can really see how her head and her tail fit perfectly together. So she is like really in this ball very tightly. Kind of like a box turtle, huh? A little bit, yeah. So it would be really hard for a predator to get in there. In fact, I don't have enough strength, I don't know if anybody does, to open her up. Like I can't force her to wake up. She's only gonna come out of this shell when she wants to. So that's a really good adaptation for keeping herself safe. How about, how do they eat? I, we haven't seen any really in the chat. What do you think would be some adaptations for them to find food or water? Pop in the chat if anyone knows and Kenton can tell us. So these guys are typically not the best with their vision. They can't see that well. So they're gonna use their nose, which you can see pretty big on there. She's starting to wake up a little bit. Do you see her face moving at all? So she's going to use her nose to smell and then she's got pretty big claws that she's going to use to look for insects. And that's her favorite thing to eat. Now those claws are gonna help her find ants or other bugs that are in the ground that she's gonna dig up. She doesn't have the strongest claws, so that, that's not an adaptation that's gonna help her build a tunnel or a home. She's probably gonna steal somebody else's tunnel and that's gonna keep her warm at night. But she's gonna use those claws and that nose to really find all of her food. She has, uh, she also has hair because she's a mammal. It's hard to see, but actually inside the carapace right there, she has some hair and we call that guard hair or trigger hair. And those hairs help her slam shut if a predator tried to get in there. So that's another adaptation to keep them safe. I saw someone wrote camouflage. Can you tell us Ooh. if camouflage is important and what is camouflage? <laughs> so camouflage is a characteristic that would help you stay safe in your environment by blending in with it. So an armadillo like this is found in South and Central America, and they're mostly found in maybe sandy, dirt, forest uh, environments. So you can imagine those are all pretty brown. So colors like this, would be really helpful camouflage to allow them to blend in with the rest of their environment. So that is a good adaptation for them. If you had, a, for instance, a blue streak on here, or if they were colored bright pink, that would not be a great camouflage for a natural sandy environment. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, Shelly, we might want to save these for later, but are there any questions that you've seen that we want to ask right now? We have so many great questions coming in. First, people are being so great guessing other different adaptations that they know of in other animals. Um, we had a great question. Is Martha scared to be handled and moved around and handled like that? So Martha is uh, comfortable being handled. She is currently in her ball because I just woke her up or she's still waking up from sleeping. She is able to come out and will come out if I offer her some food, which I actually have. Can I, I'm gonna go off screen real quick. Yeah, do that. I am excited. Has anyone seen an armadillo this close before? Mm. I'm gonna see if she's gonna eat. I don't know if she will, but we are gonna offer something. I have right here, uh, here comes a bug, bug warning. We have a little wax worm. So this is one of the many treats we get here at the National Zoo. And this wax worm, we're going to see if she's interested. She might need to be set down to eat, but we're going to give her the option. You want to? 
Let me go ahead. Let me switch our view on the computer. We'll try it this way. I'm going to set her right here. Put the bug down. Okay, now we've got a different view. Awesome. Now I have to say, this is a new environment for Martha, so she, <laughs> she may not be interested because she may be trying to make sure that she's safe. So it may take her a few minutes to come out of the, uh, the hall that she's in right now. But she uses this when she's feeling nervous and if she wants to explore a new environment. Awesome. So you get a worm, I get her claw, mm -hmm. and I heard she has a really good sense of smell. She does. So she uses that sense of smell to really feel around, to look for food, to find friends. She lives here at the small mammal house with uh, another three-banded armadillo named Julian, and they lived together for a few years. Oh, I think we just lost your sound, Caden and Kenton but we are getting tons of great questions. I'm gonna answer a couple of these while Caitlin and Kenton work to get their sound back. We had a ton of people um, asking, you know, what they look like on the inside. So, oh, are you back? Yes, now. There we are, yes, welcome yeah, back. We went, but okay. <laughs> Fantastic. We what were just about to discuss what they might look like unrolled. Oh, so underneath they have a um, underbelly that's unprotected. It just kind of looks normal. Um, and that's, of course, where a predator would want to bite them because that's unprotected. Um, so that's why they're so good at rolling into a ball. Um, but honestly, it's four legs. Uh, and then this tail that you see here will stretch out behind them. Uh, and otherwise, they're a little hairy because that's where they've got all their the hair that they need to be a mammal. You mentioned their tail, and we had somebody who I think is sneaking ahead a little bit. Do they have a prehensile tail? They do not. Their tail actually has very little movement. Um, if you, I'll pick her when I pick her up next, I'll show you that tail again. It's really just one flat surface that does not have a lot of bend to it. It can move backwards and forward, but it can't grip anything. Very cool. And so we're talking about these adaptations and how they help these animals survive. So you mentioned this armadillo, their carapace, she can roll into a ball. What are some of those predators that in the wild she might be protecting herself from? So think about animals in the wild that would eat um, an armadillo. So if we're thinking about South and Central America, we might think of um, some small cat species, especially feral dogs, um, and can uh, maybe uh, uh, big birds of prey would all be animals that would try to get an armadillo. The good news is that armadillos, these three band armadillos, that carapace is so tough that honestly, they do a pretty good job of keeping themselves from being prey. And we saw a question about, um, could they make good pets? And the answer is really no, um, because armadillos love to dig. So if you took an armadillo home with you, you wouldn't have much of a floor left anymore. In all honesty, they would I dig through your nails. You can see, yeah, they, she digs all day long for her food and she would dig up your apartment or your house um, in order to get at all of those bugs that she can hear crawling in the ground. So they're also typically more nocturnal. They're mostly up at night. So if you would like to be um, awoken at night by an animal underneath your bed, ripping up your floorboards, then I, I, and I don't think many of you do. I would recommend stay far away from armadillos as pets. My cat wakes me up enough, so. You know. Exactly, exactly. Very cool. Other great questions we are getting. Um, can you repeat, if you mentioned it, how old is Martha? I didn't mention it. Martha's 11 years old, so that's pretty good age for an armadillo. So armadillos probably live to be maybe five, 10 would be a great age in the wild. At a zoo, we hope that so many of our animals will live to be maybe even twice their lifespan. Uh, Julian, the armadillo she lives with, is over 20 years old. Uh, so we've got a lot of older animals who wouldn't survive unless they were here at the zoo with great vet care, great keeper care, plenty of food, and no predators. Martha is just doing a great job taking a snooze in this program. It's great. very slowly opening. You can see getting <laughs> yeah. a little wider and a little wider. I wonder if she's she smelling ever... that wax worm that's next I know. to her. I don't think she ever fully woke up. I honestly think she, she just decided it's nap time and I'm good. I kind of yes. did that this morning mm -hmm. trying to get out of bed. So mm -hmm. I understand that, Martha. Yeah. 
That's amazing. Oh, someone, Emily had a really great observation. Could one of the, oh, here she goes. Could one of the reasons that maybe this protects her from predators, would predators maybe think that an an armadillo is a rock instead of an animal? Mm, That's interesting. If she was asleep uh, and rolled into a ball, it would be very easy to walk by her and not even realize that she was a living animal. Oh my gosh, look at her waking up. (laughs) Let's see what um, observations are coming through as she begins to wiggle and move. Oh, is she gonna find it? They can't see very well, right? No, they can see very little. In fact, they often walk along walls because it's hard for them to see, but I think she smells that waxworm. Bam, there it is, it's gone. Are these uh, armadillos nocturnal, meaning they're only awake at nighttime? Probably in the wild, they are more typically awake um, at night. Here, thank you. I'm going to put down a bunch more bugs and see if she is interested. I've got my back hand on her because she hasn't been. Oh, thank you, Mimi. We'll add even. We've got some more mealworms too. Diversity. A divert. I mean, you can. They are all gone. Like just that quick. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I've got my back hand on her because I want to make sure she doesn't um, uh, go too far off of this ledge. So she is. Uh, likely to be more active during probably dusk and dawn, which we call crepuscular, but she, armadillos are often nocturnal, so you're only seeing them at night. Because she's at a zoo and the zookeepers are here feeding her during the day, she's usually pretty active during the day compared to her wild cousins. That's awesome. We got a couple questions about her her carapace and these kind of scale-like coverings. Do they also cover, you can actually see them right now, on her head and her tail, correct? Yeah, so you're seeing this is her head right there. And what's really cool, I just touched her tail. She did not like that as much as when we touch her back. What's really cool about armadillos is that the the, we call them scoots, those individual um, sites on on the uh, body, on the carapace. Those scoots on the forehead are unique like a fingerprint. So you can always tell each armadillo apart based on the scoot placement. And then you can see all the scoots on her tail. So again, you can see it is not... Um, very flexible. It just goes like like this, boop, 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 back and forth. Um, so she's not able to grasp anything with that. That's they really like cool. a dinosaur. They <laughs> do look like a dinosaur almost. And I think we have one more great question um, from, well, we're getting a ton of great questions, but I think we have time for just one more. We have a question from Ashton. We've talked about how these animals are suited for survival in their particular habitat. And Ashton asked, what is the armadillo's habitat like specifically that makes them such good um, residents. So these guys are typically found in South and Central America, and that's an opportunity for them to live in um, areas that have a lot of sand, dirt, uh, mulch, uh, sort of think about forests or desert environments. That's where they're going to be the most comfortable. And the reason why I specifically talk about the substrate is armadillos live on the ground, and as much as they can, they're going to dig to find Um, houses to burrow in or to find their food. So that kind of soft substrate is probably the most important part for them. I feel like like the the first ones you gave are more than these meals. Oh yeah, we always say that waxworms are like the candy of the insects because they're filled with delicious sugary goo. Yeah, she's Um, still looking for them. mm -hmm. And then the mealworms, they're they're more like a vegetable insect. So she'll Mm. eat them eventually, but she wants to make sure there's no more waxworms left. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you, Kenton. Of Everyone course. gives a thumbs up if you liked seeing our armadillo, Martha. Bye, Martha. Bye. Bye. Oh, so adorable. I had no idea that they were their heads and their scales were like fingerprints and you could eat, tell each one apart. It's crazy. Okay. So if you have not, um, oh, good. Erica just put, what is substrate? Substrates the kind of ground that they live on. So here they have mulch, like wood chips or sand or um, dirt, things like that would be their substrate. Okay, if you grab something to draw on and something to draw with, grab that. If you didn't and you wanna grab it, go for it. We are gonna create a drawing during our program. And the first thing we are gonna do is create a little armadillo shell. And remember, it had three, the three band of armadillos, which three lines. I'll share my screen so we can see the picture of the armadillo a little bit closer. If you want to remember what that shell looks like. There it is. And how she could roll up like a ball. 
we are going to, every animal that we talk about today, we're going to add to this. So we're just going to draw the shell right now. Not legs, not a tail, not anything else. But here we go. Okay, and as you're drawing that, we have used this word throughout the program today, but I wanted to really introduce it to you. So we talked about animals surviving and different ways to survive. The things we talked about were called adaptations. So everyone say the word adaptations. Ready? Adaptations. So an adaptation are all these things that let them find food, find water, find shelter. So we're going to talk about more of those today. So, which of the following are adaptations? So a poll is going to pop up. You can answer the poll or you can um, turn and tell your neighbor. How about shells for protection? Web toes for swimming? Venom to catch prey? Stripes for camouflage? Or migrating to find food? Which one of these are adaptations? Or are they, are they all adaptations? What do you think? We have tons of great answers coming in. I'm just letting everyone know that Caden muted themselves while some doors are being moved in the small yeah. mammal house. That's all. Yeah, so tons of great ones. Good. It looks like everyone's basically answering all of them. So that's perfect. All of what we put there, shells, web toes, venom, stripes, migrating, those are all different adaptations. And you might be able to think of it many more if you're thinking about what your favorite animal is and some adaptations they might have. I'm going to end the poll. Looks like we got most of our answers and I'll share the results. So you can see we all voted for a lot of different things. So great job, everybody. So we're going to talk about some different adaptations today. Not too many, but if you would like to see even more, check out the video that I made. We talk about even more different animals and their adaptations. Now we mentioned protection. We were talking about the armadillo and the shells. All animals need to protect themselves. Here are some other animals and how they protect themselves. We've got a copperhead who uses venom. A lion, they live in a big group. So they have lots of eyes looking out for danger and that is one way they protect themselves. If you hear squeaking, those are our golden lion tamarins saying hi. Here is a shell for a turtle for protection. And then camouflage, we mentioned that with our armadillo for our leaf-tailed leaf gecko right there. Now, we are going to pop up another poll. I want you to guess what animal we're going to talk about for a second. I live throughout North America. That could be a lot of different animals. I am nocturnal, so they're awake at nighttime. I, I don't know what it says, have black and white fur. My pole covered everything. And people often smell me before they see me. Do you think it is a giant panda, a skunk, a zebra, or a raccoon? Which all you'd probably smell, but one is much smellier. And you're all getting it. We'll share the results in a second. Our golden line tamarins are very excited for the answer. And they have enrichment they're getting ready for, I think. Some toys. Okay, we're going to end the poll in a second. Make sure you've turned and told your neighbor if you've got your answer. You all got it. It is skunk. Nice job, everybody. Oh, here's all the things. And here's we have striped skunks here at the National Zoo. And we just got two new skunks. Their names are Sauerkraut and Pig Pen. We aren't going to see them today because they are new. And they're still getting used to their home here at the zoo, but hopefully in a program in the future, they'll be trained to come out like our armadillo. But for protection, of course, they use those tails. So for your drawing, we're going to draw in just a second. We're going to add a skunk's tail to the drawing. But here's a video of them looking around and eating in their exhibit. And while you're watching them, if you want to look at their tail and then draw a big floofy tail, you can add your skunk's tail to the drawing. You could even maybe add some smell marks coming out right there. They're probably searching for some mealworms too, just like our armadillo was eating, but they love to eat strawberries. That's one of the favorites, right, Kitten? Yeah, all the different kinds of fruit. 
Very cute. Okay. So draw if you haven't. There's a picture of that skunk's tail. So another way they protect themselves. Now skunks have all different adaptations, just like the armadillo does. It's different color. It blends in well at nighttime since it's nocturnal. I see claws for digging food. I see a good nose with whiskers for smelling. So all different adaptations. But add in your tail right there. And you can make it look like skunk. You can even make, I'll make like a little black line right here so it can be white in the middle. All right, so now we have an animal that's got a hard shell and a tail, so some good protection. All right, the next animal we're going to go through fairly fast because I want to make sure we have lots of time with our last one. But we're going to talk about food and water. We said all animals need to eat and drink. So the turtle has hard lips. That's an adaptation for it to grab food and lettuce and different plants. The prehensile tail porcupine has hands as well as teeth. Hummingbird has a great um, beak and lots of birds have different beaks for their different ways of eating. And then cheetahs and pandas both have a very sharp teeth for eating the food they need to eat. So let's think about some different animals, maybe even your favorite animal and their adaptations for eating. What might they be some different adaptations? Could be all different things, but let's give you some clues. We're gonna guess who we're gonna draw next. Who am I? I have fur, I am a mammal. I eat small insects. I live in South America and I belong to a group named for our worm tongues. So who do we think it might be? Is it a sloth, a squirrel, an anteater or, or a kawadi? Mm, I'll give you a second to answer. You can answer the poll or turn and tell your neighbor. Oh, I see a lot of good ones. I've got a lot of you joined last month, so this is helpful, huh? Yeah, I see some clapping. I think I'm right. All right. I'll end the poll in five seconds just to get more answers in. If you don't get to push the button, just turn and tell your neighbor. Ready? Five, four, three, two, and one. All right, we'll end it. And I want to share the results because you are all correct. Good job. It was an anteater, also known as a southern tamandua, is the kind that we have here in the small mammal house. So those of you who um, joined us last month for our vet program with our veterinarians, you saw an up close um, view of this Tamandua. This is Chiquita. We also have Manny and Cheyenne. So pop in the chat, how, what is their adaptation for eating? You might remember it from last time. And if you don't, think about just anteaters. How can they eat all the little food that they eat? They like to eat lots of little insects. Good, I see lots of answers. I'll play a video while you're typing that in and it will give you a clue if you're still not sure. You can see it a little bit there. Yes, everyone in the chat is saying with their long tongue. Apps, oops, we'll go back. I didn't mean to go, we're still watching this video. Um, their tongue is about 15 inches long, which is crazy long, but they can put it down into little ant holes or even into beehives and get all of um, those insects stuck to their sticky long tongue. Good job, everybody. Okay, for our drawing, we are now going to add the tongue for the tamandua. So draw the head as well as that long tongue. And you can hear her sniffing. Some people said she finds food with her nose. Absolutely, that is true too. She'll smell her food. So I'm gonna draw the head, but I'm not gonna draw eyes or ears yet. Just gonna draw the mouth and then a very long tongue, over a foot long. All right, here's that. Let me show everyone. So now we've got 
an animal that's adapted for eating small insects, has a hard shell for protection, as well as can make some smelly, smelly smells coming out of their bottom. Okay, while you finish drawing that, I'm going to introduce the next animal. And we're going to get to see this one up close and ask some questions about the next one as well. So remember, draw that long tongue. Okay, looks like everyone's excited. So this next animal, we're going to talk about shelter. So all animals need to be able to find a safe spot to be, maybe out of the ele elements, maybe even out of winter cold. Birds will build nests, keep their eggs and babies. Beavers will build lodges. And groundhogs have all kinds of underground tunnels. Now, if you've joined me for any programs before, you know this is my favorite animal. So that's going to be clue number one. But here's the other clues. Let's see if you can guess. I live underground in Africa. I never drink water. Hmm. I'm the longest living rodent. Rodent be like a mouse, a rat, a rabbit. And I'm a mammal and I have fur, but people say I'm naked. All right, who do we have? Do you think it's a snake? A mouse, a rabbit, or a naked mole rat? Hmm. Turn and tell your neighbor or pop it in the pole. Oh, I see a lot of great guesses. Almost everyone's gotten it correct for sure. Awesome. Aiden, you are not alone. There are some other big fans of this animal in the chat. Good. They're so fun. I love seeing them. Okay, we'll keep your answers coming in, but pretty much everyone's got it. You are correct if you said naked mole rat. So this is my favorite animal. It always has been because they're just like weird, right? And they're not an animal that you'd see if you just go outside. Even in Africa, they live underground. So seeing them in zoos is about the only place you can see them. And they just have so many cool adaptations. So here we can share the results. You all got it pretty much. So good job. All right, I'm gonna show you a little bit about our naked mole rats before we have Kenton bring some over. Naked mole rats for their shelter, as I said, they live underground. They will build tunnels and burrows and they have different rooms even. So they have a room for the bathroom. They have a room for sleeping. They have a food room and you can see them just kind of eating um, some of those sweet potatoes. They'll gnaw through them. The top part of the sweet potato is going to keep growing, but they can eat that bottom part. So very cool. So think about with their adaptations, building shelter, what kinds of things do they use? And we'll have Kenton show you. Here is a video. And while you're watching the video, we're going to finish our drawing. Look at their feet closely. This is part of their shelter building. So add feet to your drawing. So add the bottom part of the animal. We've got legs, we've got some toes. I see some hair on those toes. So you could add that in as well. All right, I'm gonna add some hair. And instead of just seeing our video, Kenton's gonna come show us some up close. Remember, if you have questions, pop them in the Q&A box and not the chat, so that way we are able to see them. All right, we're going to stop the share so we can see us closer. Here we go. All right, Hi everybody, I'm back. So again, I'm Kenton. I work here at the National Zoo in the Small Mammal House, and I am sharing three naked mole rats. And Kitten, actually, I think we'll do this camera. Yeah, they seem to all be, have settled down at the moment. Do it just like we did with the armadillo, because they yeah. it's nap time for everyone right now, I think. So these are fairly old naked mole rats, too, so they've earned the right to take their time. There they are. There we go. I'm going to move them around a little bit so you can all see them a little bit better. And I'll handle them so we can even see them up close. So these are three naked mole rats, and it is, I think, very kind of Caden to say that they are a favorite animal, <laughs> because not a lot of people like them, because they, they look like mice or rats, and I think that is... An opinion that I cannot agree with. These are some of the coolest animals at the zoo for sure. So I have here three naked mole rats. 
They live in big colonies underground in Africa, and they have some of the weirdest traits that you will ever hear of. Now, of course, we're talking about adaptations. Adaptation number one is that they're called naked for a reason, right? It looks like they don't have any hair. But honestly, the secret to naked mole rats is that they're not really naked. They do have hair in some places. And I'm gonna pick one up so you can see kind of close up of what a naked mole rat face looks like. If you can see on that face, those are whiskers, and that's definitely hair. So naked mole rats do have to have hair because guess what? They're a mammal and all mammals have hair. Now that hair is really helpful because underground, it's very difficult to see because guess what? There's no light. So those hairs on their face allow them to feel around really easily when they're in the tunnels. So they use those whiskers to feel what's going on. If there's an air pressure change and they know that there's an opening to the outside somewhere, they can feel if another naked mole rat is passing them. Now, Caden also mentioned that he saw hair on their toes and fingers, right? Now, that's because their feet have a little bit of hair on them to help them act like brooms. Because when you're moving hair around back and forth, or excuse me, when you're moving dirt around back and forth in your tunnels, that's a lot of work. They do that all day long to build those tunnels. So they use the hair between their toes and fingers to really move uh, all of that dirt around just like a broom. So it's really helpful, another adaptation to make their lives underground even easier. Now, often people will say, well, if you live underground, why do you need eyes? Because I just said, it's really hard to see, right? There's not a lot of light. I'm gonna pick this mole rat up one more time and show you his face again. You can see he's got little tiny eyes and those eyes are not very useful. They really can't see very much of anything. And so they use the rest of their body, their sense of smell, um, their uh, whiskers to help feel around since they can't see. The eyes have almost become useless, which is fine. You don't need them underground. Yeah, that makes sense. Do mm -hmm. they have a good sense of smell? They have a great sense of smell. Mm -hmm. What's interesting, though, is they probably have a better sense of vibration because underground, you can't feel anything or you can't see anything. So again, you're feeling bunches of things underground, all sorts of movement. So that sense of vibration probably really helps them underground. Yeah. Why do you think they make their tunnels? Why not just live above ground? Mm. Well, living above ground has its, its, its pros and cons. Um, for naked mole rats, living underground allows them a couple different good opportunities. One, you stay away from most of your predators. Their biggest predator is a snake that can climb down into their tunnels, but they're very good at keeping snakes away. We can talk about that adaptation. Underground is where all their food is. So their favorite thing to eat is yams. That's what they eat. They're found in Africa and Somalia, Ethiopia, and Kenya. And underground, there are yams that grow there. So pretty much the same as a sweet potato. And that is their favorite thing to eat. So by living underground, they have access to that sweet potato, that yam, almost all the time. So again, that helps them stay protected. That's my favorite thing for Thanksgiving as well. So. I see it very timely. Yeah. yeah. Now, the loss of hair means that they can't stay out in the sun for very long. So they don't need to live underground because otherwise they would get sunburned really easily. Now, I said that they have good adaptations for keeping predators away. And I'm going to pick up another mole rat so you can see what I'm talking about. You probably already saw it, but it is their gigantic front teeth. So naked mole rats are rodents and all rodents have constantly growing teeth. And those front four teeth that come out uh, from the front of the mouth, they're actually not even in their mouth. The top two are coming out from underneath the nose and the bottom two are coming out from the chin. So their lips are behind their teeth. And that's an adaptation to allow them to chew their tunnels, move all that dirt around without actually getting all that dirt in their digestive system. That way they're not eating dirt. Mm -hmm. So they use those big, big teeth to keep snakes away. So the, the mole rat, some of them, if a predator gets in, they have a way to communicate. They have an adaptation. They'll make squeak noises. They'll hear each other. They'll say a predator's come in. All of the soldier mole rats will run to the snake and try to bite it to death to protect the whole colony yeah. of mole rats. And they do have some nails, but those aren't really for protection, more for digging. Exactly. Yeah, they're not very good. They don't have a lot of musculature, a lot of strength in their arms and legs, so they can't do much scratching, but they can do a lot of biting. They have about 20 to 25 percent of their muscles. So the same amount of muscles in our legs, just in their jaw. Oh, wow. So they can chew through concrete if you gave them enough time. So that's really helpful for them in order to keep a predator away and to dig the tunnels. Crazy. Now, is being naked an adaptation? 
Absolutely. So being underground, it's really dirty, it's really dusty, and there's all sorts of mites and parasites that live there. So the loss of that hair allows them to stay healthy. They wow. don't get that dirty, they don't get that dusty, and that doesn't have a lot of opportunities for fleas or other parasites to grab onto your skin. I did see someone ask if they got fleas, so mm -hmm. not really. Not really. Awesome. Yeah. Um, Shelly, do we have questions from the audience? We have such great questions coming in. I know that you're not surprised there. Um, tons of observations about their skin and really their lack of hair. Can you talk a little bit about why they don't have so much hair like all of our other mammals and why they're so wrinkly? Yeah, that's a great question. Great observations. And that's one of the first things people notice when they come to the zoo and see them. So that lack of hair keeps them nice and healthy, right? We just talked about how it keeps the parasites off. Also, underground in Africa, it's really hot and humid. So it's about uh, 85 to 95 degrees with a high humidity. Imagine going to a summer vacation at the beach. Let's say Florida, where it's really humid, right? And it feels really uncomfortable. Imagine living like that all day and all night long. Well, what do we do? We put on shorts and t-shirts and bathing suits. We do not wear jackets and sweaters and hats and mittens in the middle of, of the summer in Florida, right? And so that's what Naked Morats did. They just moved to their summer clothing all year long. So that's really why they've lost a lot of that hair too, because it's just too hot otherwise. Now, the wrinkles is another interesting adaptation. So they have lost a lot of their subcutaneous fat, which is a really big word, which really just means under the skin. So we all have fat under our skin, right? And if you pinch yourself, your skin doesn't really stick up that tight. But if I pinched a naked mole rat, and this does not hurt them, I promise. If you pinch a naked mole rat skin, look how much of it just comes right off. It has a, it's really loose, right? It's almost like they're wearing clothing in this regard. And that's because they've lost a lot of that fat. And that's because fat keeps you warm. We, I, we, I'm sure we, everyone knows or have talked about how animals might have blubber in the Arctic that keeps them um, nice and warm. Naked mole rats don't need that fat. So instead, they have um, that really loose skin, which allows them to go across maybe like a sharp rock underground, and they get snagged like they're wearing clothing instead of getting a scratch. And a scratch could get infected and get them sick. You so know, puppies also have a lot of extra skin mm -hmm. yeah, for them to grow into. Exactly. That's awesome. And we're seeing another kind of um, behavior from them, right? They're all kind of piled together. Can you talk about why they huddle together like this? Sure. There's two main reasons. So one is that they're a very close-knit social group. Naked mole rats live in big colonies. And the colonies live together their whole lives and work together. They all have very specific jobs. And so they they often sleep together. And that's probably to help um, really bond the group together like a family, make sure that they're all feeling very comfortable with each other. Also, because I talked about how they don't have any fat and they don't have a lot of hair, it can get cool very quickly. So it's about 70, 75 degrees here at Small Mammal House. So it's a little cooler than their exhibit at this moment. So they're all staying huddled together so that they can conserve that heat right now. It's warm to us, though. Mm -hmm. It's warm back here. That is great. And unfortunately, I think we only have time for one more question. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that they're living primarily underground. Can you talk a little bit about them in this um, box of shavings right now? Sure. So this is a demo box so that we could transport them here so you could get a closer view. And we use this to transport the mole rats from place to place, but this isn't their normal exhibit. Normally when they're on exhibit, they live in uh, plastic tubes and chambers that we've created that mimics exactly what they would live in underground. We put these wood chips in here. That's what these yellow things are. These are wood chips and that's to mimic dirt. And they move those wood chips around um, all day long. So that way they're able to uh, kind of exhibit the natural behaviors of digging tunnels underground in Africa. So the combination of all of that means that they have an exhibit they can dig in underground here at the Small Mammal House in Washington, DC. So luckily for them, they have a great time moving all these shavings around. We change them every day because they get dirty. Um, it gives them an opportunity to build uh, and move things around. And it really mimics how, what it's like to live underground. 
And we got a great comment. Yes, Caden, I think you were going the same place that I was, that we got yeah. a comment from Megan that they love watching them on the webcam. So if you want to see what their exhibit looks like, what those underground tunnels that we've modeled for them, you can check out our 24-hour naked mole rat webcam. Alexis went ahead and dropped that link in the chat. So uh, go ahead and check that out. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you, Kenton. Of thank course. you to our naked mole rats as well. Everyone give a heart emoji if you love seeing them up close. I know I did. Well, thank you, Kaden. Awesome. I'm going to set them, send them back to their exhibit. Sounds great. Bye, everybody. All right. So we saw a lot of really cool animals today. I'm going to go back to sharing my screen just so you can finish your naked mole rat feet drawing if you need to. So we are going to go right to that one so you can see those teeth a little bit closer like kenton said notice those the lips behind the teeth for digging all right i'm gonna go grab my drawing and it's a really kind of funny different animal isn't it well i'm gonna stop sharing so if you've got your armadillo shell you've got your skunk protection with their stinky tail you've got your feet for digging Naked mole rats also use their teeth for digging. So you could always add some teeth up front with your sticky tongue. So maybe it can sm catch small insects, but it also has teeth. They're hard to see. Now we created our own animal with lots of different adaptations. So what would you name your animal? Hmm. Now our animal is also missing a couple things and you can finish this animal however you'd like with eyes. I'm going to do maybe some owl eyes so we can see really well at nighttime, those big eyes. And how about some ears? I'm going to draw some big fennec fox ears. Great for hearing and even cooling their body down. But you can pick whatever you'd like, maybe your favorite animal. Afterwards, you can draw your habitat. You can write a story about a day in the life of this animal and see how it survives. So there's lots of fun things you can do here. But there's what it looks like. I'm going to name this Caden Jr. That's what this one's going to be called for now, but you can name yours whatever you want. Okay, so we'll be back to sharing the screen. I have a couple more things to show you. So one of the poles, we usually talk about animals here at the zoo, but there are animals all around us in all different habitats. So when you're outside looking at different animals, think about the adaptations that they have. And in your local habitats, what can you do to help save these species? They have adaptations to help them, but we can help them as well. Would you pick up litter? Stay on trails? Tell my friends and family what I find when I go exploring? Learn more about animals and habitats? Or take pictures to learn more later? Turn and tell your neighbor or pop it in the poll. I definitely do all of these. I think the one I do the most, or maybe the two I do the most, is picking up litter and then taking pictures of cool things I find. And that way I remember to go back and look up and learn more about them later. I always do that. I will right, we'll leave this poll open for you. Now, remember I said there is um, an email that you can email us off. If you want to email us a, a picture, of your drawing or even the story or the habitat you draw with this animal we just drew go for it it's the emails at the bottom you can take a picture or it's on our website we also have the suited for survival worksheet if you want to create your own or write a little story about it we would love to see it so definitely email it our way now our next program we are going to get a sneak peek a little bit early preview of our new birdhouse exhibit. So we're gonna talk about migration. It's called migration pit stops. We're gonna talk about birds. What is migration and why do they do it? So join me on Wednesday, January 18th at 2 p.m. Eastern for that. Thank you all for joining us today. I hope that you have a wonderful week. Go explore, look for adaptations around. Think about your favorite animals and what adaptations they have and how you can help them out in the wild. Thanks everybody. Have a great week and we'll see you later. Bye.